Hello and welcome to Praxis, the monthly series of debates and discussions relating to international development issues hosted by the World Bank in Sydney. My name is Ian Gerrard and as ever I'd like to extend a special welcome to everyone watching at home on television or over the internet or listening on radio across the Asia Pacific. Today, in addition to our audience here in Sydney, we are again joined live by participants in Timor-Leste and we look forward to hearing their questions and thoughts a little later. This month's topic is development in post-conflict states. And on the panel to, to discuss this issue are Kantan Shankar, the World Bank's Manager Operations and Portfolio for Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Islands, Mark McGillivray, Chief Economist of the Australian Agency for International Development, better known as, as AusAid, and Michael Smith, who is Founding Executive Director of the Asia-Pacific Civil Military Centre of Excellence. Conflict has been called the antithesis of development and the challenges facing post-conflict states are many. Last month, Timor-Leste President Jose Ramos Horta spoke of his hope that his country could become a role model for post-conflict nations, but warned that would only happen if every citizen was committed to preventing a recurrence of violence. It's a worthy goal, but United Nations Secretary-General Secretary Ban Ki-moon recently warned that too often the window of opportunity to deliver peace dividends in the post-conflict period is missed. The UN counts that window as being open for two years after the main conflict in a country has ended and believes that is the perfect time to provide basic security, shore up and build confidence in the political process and strengthen core national capacity to lead peace building efforts, thereby beginning to lay the foundations for sustainable development. If peace is to be sustainable, Ban Ki-moon has argued, the international community must make the most of these make or break moments and provide the right support at the right time. Why then is that opportunity being missed? According to Lakhdar Brahimi, former special advisor to the UN Secretary General, there are two areas that require further focus to bring about lasting peace in post-conflict countries. More knowledge and understanding of local and regional conditions and prioritizing the rebuilding of national institutions. Brahimi also stresses the importance of the international community recognizing and respecting the wishes of the local population. He argues that it should be obvious to all concerned, but, but alas it is not, that the sole agenda around which everyone should unite in a post-conflict situation can only be one that serves the interest of the people we pretend to be there to help, and them alone. The reality, however, is that there invariably is a plurality of different agendas, and if the national interest of the local population is not totally ignored, it is rarely given the priority it deserves. And moving beyond governance, post-conflict nations have to address the crucial issue of, if, of infrastructure building or rebuilding, as well as dealing with significant social problems, particularly where food supplies, housing and health provision are concerned. And of course, all of this is set against the backdrop of ever-present worry that a return to full-blown conflict is possible. It's time now to hear from our panellists. Once they have had their say, I'll invite questions from the audience, both here in Sydney and in Dili. Our first panellist is Kantan Shankar, a man with considerable first-hand experience in post-conflict nations. Before becoming manager operations and portfolio for Timor-Leste, Papua New Guinea and the Pacific Islands in February 2009, Kantan was responsible for infrastructure projects in Russia, Azerbaijan and Belarus. From 2004 to 2007, he was the country manager for Kosovo and he has also worked in the Middle East Department and managed projects in the West Bank and Gaza, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Jordan and Syria. Kenton. Thank you, Ian. Uh, the World Bank president refers to uh, the, this topic, which we are supposed to be discussing today, as a development challenge of our era. Also, during one of his uh, earlier speeches uh, um, uh, during this year, he talks about why the, uh, why the establishment of the World Bank in 1944, and one of the main reasons is, is for uh, post-conflict reconstruction type of work, immediately after the Second World War. Uh, the assumption at that point was that reconstruction and uh, development will assist in uh, 
economic progress, aid uh, political uh, stability, and also secure the peace. You fast forward that 60 years, and uh, we are still uh, in, in this business of post-conflict reconstruction work, the work which we do in Afghanistan, the work which we do in Iraq, the work which we do in Sierra Leone, Liberia, Timor-Leste, and many, many other countries. Uh, the, and we are still trying to understand the nexus between economic growth, governance, and, uh, political, uh, uh, and uh, uh, political stability. Um, in, uh, as far as uh, the bank goes, uh, we have uh, provided development assistance of nearly $3 billion just last year for uh, 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 fragile and conflict-affected states. Um, uh, the question could certainly be asked, why this focus on fragile and conflict-affected states uh, by the World Bank in particular and, and development community at large? I, uh, there are, poverty is one of the main reasons, and uh, uh, if you look at uh, the low-income countries, 22% of uh, uh, the poverty rate is around about, averaging about 22%. But if you look at the fragile states as a whole, it is 56% poverty rate. Uh, one third of uh, all uh, uh, children not going to school are in these fragile states. Half the child deaths in, uh, in uh, the world are in fragile states. One third of the population in these states do not have um, uh, uh, safe water supply and sanitation. And uh, uh, most striking of all, 340 million of this 1 billion people living in fragile states are the poorest in the world. So this is a huge development issue, and that's the reason the bank is very focused on this issue. Uh, uh, the, the interventions in fragile states from, forms one of our strategic themes, one of our six strategic themes in the World Bank. Uh, according to uh, Paul Collier, who's the leading thinker on fragility and conflict, uh, post-conflict -con post countries are twice as likely to slide back into conflict within 10 years. And this conflict trap of violence uh, weakens governments and reduces growth rates as much as 2.3%. So while there's a lot of work, there's, uh, there's studies done, there are, uh, uh, there are quite, a, quite a lot of topics which are discussed quite extensively on uh, development and security, I just want to be given the opportunity to talk about two examples which, which uh, are extremely relevant to the group of countries in the Pacific which I've been personally involved in. One of the challenges uh, uh, is unemployment, unemployment and youth unemployment in particular. Uh, and the other is uh, natural resources and how natural resources need to be used in a sustainable way to, and also to ensure that the benefits go, flow back to the country as a whole. Going back to the first example on employment, uh, uh, unemployment and the, and the challenges of unemployment. Um, during the mid-90s, there was a huge problem in West Bank and Gaza which, with rapid uh, unemployment, which actually happened nearly overnight, where thousands of Palestinians were out of work. And the World Bank was uh, asked to, uh, uh, to come and assist the Palestinian government in creating um, uh, addressing this, this uh, social uh, uh, problem. Um, and, and, and the project which we, which we developed in West Bank and Gaza, mainly the Rapid Employment Creation Program, at one point we were creating nearly 20,000 jobs per month in, uh, in, the, in the territories. But more importantly, that particular progr pro program developed into a more uh, long-term and sustainable infrastructure upgrading type of community-based projects, which really took off. In, in about five years, we were able to do more of hundreds of uh, small infrastructure type of projects, created a lot of jobs, uh, spurred the local private sector, and also built a sense of ownership uh, within the, these small Palestinian communities, mainly in the, in the rural areas. The other example which I want to talk about is with regards to natural resources. This, again, is another post-conflict country, uh, Kosovo. 
uh, in, uh, in the early 2000, around about 2004-2005, when Kosovo was still under the mandate of the UN. Um, it was, uh, again, one of the poorest countries in the Balkans. But they also realized that they have an opportunity in, in terms of their mineral wealth. In particular, they had high quality lignite or coal, which they wanted to use to generate electricity. And here, a, a country with, uh, or at that particular time, it was, uh, uh, the, it was under UN mandate, uh, didn't have the necessary institutions. Um, uh, there was an opportunity for pri a huge private sector involvement and huge amounts of uh, private investment coming into this, uh, into this territory. Um, obviously, with the, with the government, with the low capacity, the government, uh, it, it felt extremely vulnerable. And I think, in, in, and this is a typical aspect of post-conflict countries, where institutions are either destroyed, there's lack of human capital, there's uh, probably people were killed, people went as refugees, uh, the education system breaks down, and so to come in with huge amounts of money, there's always this feeling that they are vulnerable to exploitation. So in that type of an aspect, again, I think the bank took, uh, uh, um, uh, foresaw um, uh, issues such as this based on our experiences elsewhere, and our main focus in West Bank, uh, in Kosovo, was building institutions. And one of the institutions which we helped build was the Ministry of uh, Energy. And this, uh, even before uh, this uh, idea of private investment into the electricity generation sector, and this built a lot of trust within the uh, within the uh, within Kosovo, and and that uh, and that trust continued to to carry forward as we were helping them in not only providing them with technical assistance but also providing the necessary funds for the transaction advisors. So these are just two small examples of my personal experience working in these countries, but also, more importantly, which are very relevant to the countries in our region. We are trying to, to look at, uh, for example, under employment uh, creation, workfare type of programs. We are working on a project in Timor-Leste. We are working on a project in the Solomons, and so too in uh, PNG. So I'll, I'll uh, leave it at that, and uh, probably we'll get more opportunities to discuss uh, a little detail during the question time. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Kantan. Uh, now we're going to hear from Mark McGillivray. Mark has been Chief Economist at AusAid since March 2008, having previously been Deputy Director of the World Institute for Development Economics Research, which is a United Nations think tank located in Helsinki in Finland. Mark. Good. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, what I'll do is I'll, I guess, pick up on some of the uh, points dealt with by Canton, but give very much a, an AusAid perspective on um, aid delivery and some of the development challenges in conflict-affected states. Um, delivery of aid to conflict-affected states is a major challenge um, for the official Australian aid program. Um, over three quarters of our major bilateral programs are in countries that are vulnerable to, uh, have experienced or are recovering from conflict. These countries include Afghanistan, Iraq, Nepal, Pakistan, Solomon Islands, East Timor and Zimbabwe. Um, we haven't quite spent the three billion dollars on uh, fragile and conflict affected states that the bank spends. But we have, though, nonetheless, in the financial year 2009-2010, uh, committed more than one billion Australian dollars in Australian bilateral aid to fragile, conflict-affected countries. That represents about 65% of our total bilateral aid program. So, in short, we have quite a, a ma for us, what's a very major investment um, in conflict-affected countries. Uh, our aid program to the Solomon Islands is the, uh, the third largest uh, bilateral program that we have. Um, the Solomon Islands, as you'll be aware, is a very small country. Our aid flows to the Solomons are very large compared to the size of its economy. But we recognise that not only in the Solomon Islands and elsewhere, where countries are either in conflict or have recently emerged from conflict, that we do need to make a very big investment to be able to sustain peace and security 
to be able to provide, if you like, the building blocks or the prerequisites to achieve development um, in the long run. Um, we're very much committed to the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, we know that uh, in conflict-affected countries, achieving those goals or even having some progress towards them is an enormous challenge. And unless we address security issues in a very clever way, in which we very uh, strategically look at the nexus between security and development, we won't get the sort of outcomes that we hope to achieve. So what I'll do, um, hopefully fairly briefly, um, is to um, uh, reflect on some challenges that we face, mainly looking at uh, East Timor and the Solomon Islands, but in doing that, um, introduce, hopefully for discussion, um, what I call um, five uh, principles that should guide donor interventions, donor programs, in conflict-affected countries. Um, these five principles um, were based on uh, fieldwork and various research programs in conflict-affected states conducted over the last 20 years. Um, the fieldwork was very much based in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, looking at countries such as Liberia, Mozambique and Sierra Leone. But I think though there is, uh, well I would argue at least, that the, the principles have some um, uh, or fairly universal application across con conflict affected states. So on that note, let me sort of delve into my notes and uh, outline some of these, um, some of these principles. Um, I, I think they're common sense, but what may appear to be common sense to one person is not necessarily common sense to someone else. The first principle is um, for donors to, uh, f if donors are to achieve um, broad-based post-conflict recovery in conflict affected states, it's very important that they be, get involved in those states before the conflict ends. So the first principle is basically get involved before the conflict ends. In many conflicts, there are opportunities to get involved in poverty reduction efforts rather than purely focusing on the delivery of humanitarian assistance before a peace deal may have been achieved. Um, such early action is crucial because securing and building human capital of the poor will do much to ensure that they come out of war with at least some skills to use when peace is achieved. Uh, basically, it ensures that donors can get some early and important runs on the board to be able to provide a platform for growth and development. Um, AusAid recognises um, the need to move beyond aid interventions that work around conflict or only in post-conflict settings to become, uh, to be more preventative or to, to move to more preventative engagement in conflict-prone um, environments. It, there's very much a, a need to integrate development <laughs> programs into military interventions. This will, this will help achieve peace, but it's a two-way street. Uh, we also recognise the need to further integrate conflict prevention and peace building into development programs ensuring that Australian aid program is positioned to actively work in and with, with conflict. The second principle is um, what I call uh, focusing on poverty but avoiding uh, wish lists. Um, although poverty reduction is a core priority, such reduction depends on clearly defining priorities and providing enough resources, both financial and human, to, to execute these or achieve these priorities. Um, many post-conflict uh, recovery strategies get swamped by which wish lists, wish lists that contain too many priorities that are often poorly conceived and have little chance of implementation. I think we're all aware of the challenge that you know, everything is important and everything is a priority. Therefore, we need to do everything in post-conflict countries. And that can't be done. Um, uh, what, what we need um, is a clear consensus around the primacy of a small set of things or tasks um, that have to be done well and for donors to avoid being dragged into doing too much and taking on too many activities. So that's, that's principle number two. Um, I, I would add the, the experience of, of Timor Leste um, I think um, points to the, the relevance on um, on this priority. 
there there has been a case where donor activities have been overly fragmented um, spread across uh, often too many areas and it is this case that we have to move in quickly and again you know everything is important it has to be done now everything is a priority we can't actually have a ranking um, of activities because everything needs to be done now. And I think this ha has happened and has certainly been our experience in Timor Leste. Principle three, uh, focus on broad based recovery from war. Uh, war causes immense human suffering and broadens and deepens poverty. Ending war obviously saves lives, but may do little for livelihoods. Refugees and internally displaced people will resettle. But without sufficient human capital, infrastructure and secure assets, access to their assets, they were unable to be able to participate fully in any post-conflict recovery. Uh, donors therefore need to be clear in the poverty focus of their post-conflict um, assistance. As I said earlier, um, you know, the, we, the Australian Aid Program is very much committed to the Millennium Development Goals. Poverty reduction is a clear central objection of the, uh, objective of the Australian aid program in all country contexts. But again, we recognise that conflict affected countries arguably represent the biggest challenge to achieving the Millennium Development Goal targets. Um, Australia's response to post conflict recovery in the Solomon Islands through Ramsey, the regional assistance mission to the Solomon Islands, does reflect this broad based um, approach to, to recovery. For the Australian aid program, the response in the Solomons was to increase aid funding and to take on a range of interventions, some dealing directly with communities, to help maintain basic service delivery and reduce the number of people falling into poverty as a result of conflict. But at the same time, supporting uh, the repair and reform of the machinery of government um, and, and economic recovery and growth. Principle four, to help reduce insecurity, so aid can contribute, oh, well, the fourth principle, sorry, is to help reduce insecurity so that aid can contribute more effectively to growth and poverty reduction. Here, this is very much about the nexus between security and development. The international community needs to deploy effective force to maintain uh, spoilers, or to contain spoilers, I should say, namely those who would like to see a return to conflict and to reduce their access to weapons, finance, and the markets for the spoils of war, natural resources in particular. So basically this is an argument that unless we achieve security, we're certainly not going to be able to achieve um, development in the long run. Uh, a, a key lesson from Australia's experience in the Solomon Islands is that uh, responding to complex state collapse requires an integrated response um, to that country's situation. Um, drawing on government expertise, uh, police, military in particular, but also departments of treasury and finance. Um, aid interventions in their own are insufficient to break, to prevent breakdown of law and order and cannot respond alone to widespread criminality, extortion and high level corruption. Wishing not to run out of time, uh, principle five uh, refers a little bit more to the long run. Okay, look, projecting forward a little here, um, you know, looking beyond the immediate post-conflict um, period um, and looking towards economic reform in conflict-affected states. Um, in looking at economic reform, it's imperative to focus on improving public expenditure management and revenue mobilisation. Conflict does have fiscal dimensions. Aid flows can buy time for domestic political actors to reach working agreements and rebuild necessary uh, revenue and institutions. Uh, aid flows, however, to reconstructing economies can quickly tail off and political actors will have trouble in the future if they cannot uh, if, or if they neglect a reasonably early attention to revenue mobilisation. Societies cannot build peace without transparent public accounting, effective use of natural resource wealth for public spending and strong institutions that mobilise public revenues for clear development purpose. Um, our experience in Ramsey in the Solomon Islands highlighted uh, that if you cannot build, um, if you do not achieve strong public financial management, you can't build a police force, you can't build a prison, and in particular, you can't run schools and hospitals. 
So really having a public financial management focus is very, very important to achieving uh, security and development in the long run. On that point, I'll thank you for your time. Lovely. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce Michael Smith. Mike is the founding executive director of the Asia-Pacific Civil Military Centre of Excellence, which was established by the Australian government in 2008. From 2002 until 2008, he was CEO of Ostcare, which is now ActionAid Australia, following 34 years in the Australian Defence Force. Mike is actively engaged in international forums on issues relating to humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, peacekeeping, peace building and complex peace operations and the protection of civilians. Mike. Thanks Ian. Good afternoon everybody and uh, bon dia to our friends in Dili. Uh, nice to be with you. Um, I've been asked to talk about the security development nexus and I want to stress here that what I'm talking about is a plea for a more co coherent and a long-term approach. And when we talk about post-conflict, we're talking about communities and governments really resurrecting themselves or being established from war and conflict. And by conflict, I include general lawlessness that might prevail in a country and therefore has a security dimension. As well, where conflicts have occurred, we need to be talking about getting over the remnants of war, such things as landmines and cluster munitions. Thankfully, they don't uh, prevail greatly in the Asia Pacific, except from World War II. But nevertheless, those conditions can affect development for a long time. I'm going to cover, in a very short period of time, three key issues. Firstly, I want to say a few words about the context and the approach. Secondly, I want to mention a few of the foundations for advancing development through the security development prison. And then finally, I'll say a very few words about the other nexus, which is the civil military nexus in all of this. In relation to the, con uh, the, the context and approach agenda, uh, I guess my first entree into the security development nexus really happened when I was a young man in Papua New Guinea. And being out there on all my patrols, I could see the need for this importance of having security and allowing development to occur in what was then, and sadly, some 40 years later still is, a very poverty-prone country. But clearly, that's what coloured my thinking. I then saw it in Cambodia as a much more senior officer, <laughs> witnessing the effects of a war going on with the Khmer Rouge, and even when that finished, the problems of the mines that still lay behind before people could really start recovering. But most recently, it was actually in Timor-Leste, where in 2000, the Vice President of the World Bank uh, came and I had time with him. And at that time I gave him a paper called The Security Development Nexus. And I was talking all about how that the, this country could never go ahead unless security and development were done together. So I'm really delighted that the current president of the World Bank, Robert Zellick, talks now about securing development and bringing these two things together. And of course, he does so all the time, whenever he speaks, in terms of emphasising that it is the rule of law that is, and governance that is absolutely critical to this security development nexus. He talks all the time about the various actors having to work together and that if actors work in a sole fashion, then the results won't be there. So I really commend the World Bank on where they're going in this dimension. I want to emphasise in this contextual little part of my talk that what we're dealing with here is actually chaos. A country coming out of conflict is in chaos. And what makes it more chaotic is not only the various elements of that country, that is the domestic aspects of it and the contesting views and priorities from within that country, but it's all the international 
uh, assistance that comes on board. And trying to make sense out of all these players is very difficult, but it's an essential requirement. We have state and non-state actors all working there, purport, reportedly for the, be the better good of that country. But often, in my experience, the people who are the most disempowered and have the least say in the decision making is often the people in that country themselves. We need to do better. So, in terms of the context and the approach, I would argue that we need a better coordinated and a longer term approach if we're going to help countries come out of conflict. In terms of the, uh, some of the foundations for advancing development in this security development prison, I think that if we go back to the OECD DAX 10 principles for good international engagement in fragile states and situations from April 2007, we actually get a good list of principles to follow. And it's not my intention to go through those in any detail. You can read those yourself. But it is interesting that number five talks about uh, or recognising the links between political, security and development objectives. And unless these links are made and followed through, then development won't really occur in an effective way. There's four key areas for improvement that come out of those, uh, those principles, I think. The first is a need for sharing, analysis and assessment so that we don't get different organisations moving in different directions. Secondly, there is a requirement for a common strategy. This is always very difficult to achieve, as we're seeing at the moment in Afghanistan. The third is the need for effective collaboration and coordination. And sometimes this will mean that you agree to disagree, but at least you understand where the other player is and that you're prepared to share that information. And finally, there needs to be a lot more done in terms of shared performance measurement. And by that, we have to include, in my view, much more emphasis on qualitative measurement rather than just quantitative measurement. I could tell you a very interesting story about road development in Timor-Leste by one of the Bretton Woods organisations, um, which reflects the point I'm trying to make here about qualitative versus quantitative. So since those principles were, uh, were sort of given to us as foundations, of course, this year, in March 2009, there was the 3C roadmap, the three Cs being coherent, coordinated and complementary. Um, and I think there's more guidance and a roadmap that's come out of that. So the principles, and we know what we have to do, it's making it happen. So let me sort of uh, finish up on my third point, which is about the civil military nexus. And you won't find it surprising that I'm talking about this, given that I'm the founding director of the Civil Military Centre of Excellence. And when I talk about civil and military, I also include police. I include police as one of the important actors under the civil uh, group of, grouping of uh, organisations. The first point I want to make is that all of us in this civil military dimension are sharing the same space. Now we can have long discussions and, uh, and disagreements and agreements about the issue of humanitarian space and who does what in that humanitarian space. But what I am talking about here is that these various entities are all in the same place at the same time. And in order for development to occur in a meaningful way and security to be assured, there needs to be a lot of cross-fertilisation and a lot of sharing of information. At the moment, the centre has been privileged to help the World Bank on an internal study which is actually looking at the security development nexus. And we've been facilitating lots of interviews for this. Um, the first draft of that paper has, has just come out. 
and it's very interesting to see what's emerging from it. And two case studies are being looked at in particular, and they being Bougainville and the Solomon Islands. But in coming up with this study, two other case studies, Timor-Leste and Cambodia, were also looked at. And we're looking at lessons from Australia's experience. The fundamental theme that emer is emerging from this study so far comes under the heading of knowing each other would support working together. So this is largely a knowledge management issue. We, we must continue, I think, to, to work closely together. And I think there are five security development entry points, or as Karen Malul, the author of this report, calls it, bridges to help bind us. And these all have civil military implications. The first is a renewed emphasis on counter-insurgency warfare and stabilisation doctrines. It's very interesting this has come out as, a, as one of the major uh, issues. Secondly, that there is a striking balance between international and local intent and often the two aren't in sync. The third comes to this critical issue of the rule of law and governance. And it talks about the need for better security system reform as one of the critical challenges for effective state building. The fourth, if I can get them to accept it, is the need to include the protection of civilians in everything that is done in this security development nexus. At the moment, mechanisms to bring together police, military, humanitarian workers and link that to a political architecture and a national security framework has a long way to go. But we should remind ourselves that there are currently about six missions worldwide, UN missions, that have protection of civilians as a mandated task. And the final uh, issue that's coming out from this study is actually that police and the development of police acts as a bridge in this security development nexus. So let me conclude by quoting the words, not of the President of the World Bank or, or anyone else, but of my own Chief of Staff, Alison Chartres. Because Alison is from Osaid and she has been head of that fragile states area for quite a while and I'm privileged to have her. And I asked her to give me her thoughts on this question. And this is how she summed it up. She says, development approaches need to reflect the security development nexus and give due attention and support to the combined efforts of diplomats, development experts and security personnel in creating the enabling environment for development to prosper. These approaches must involve and strengthen host governments and local actors to ensure ownership, develop capacity and promote sustainable development in a secure environment. Obrigado. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. It's now time for, uh, for questions from our audience here in Sydney and also in Dili. We're going to start off with um, a question for Mark from Abraham Joseph of the UN Integrated Mission in Timor-Leste. Uh, Abraham says, it is one year since the GFC gripped the world economy. What has been the policy response of Timor-Leste to the current global crisis and global slowdown? Also, what kind of uh, policy response should Timor-Leste pursue if the crisis continues? Okay. Um, I, I, I say a few things on the, on the global recession or the global financial crisis. Um, maybe let me focus on what I think governments need to do, um, and including the, the government of Timor-Leste. Um, a lesson about the global financial crisis is it is really much about, if you like, the downside of globalisation. Um, we, uh, for many years, have been encouraging um, all countries to integrate with the global economy, um, particularly countries that are resource-rich resource and uh, have the capacity for large levels of exports, in including Timor-Leste. 
Now, of course, the, the upside of that is that when the global economy is, is growing, um, countries that have a high export base grow with the global economy. The downside, of course, is that when the global economy um, turns, uh, turns bad, when demand in, in particular developed countries uh, drops, countries that are opened up to the global economy uh, suffer. And uh, now, while Timor-Leste has uh, not had some of the uh, experience, some of the impacts of other developing countries, it, there have been adverse effects. So what countries really need to do, though, is to get much smarter about the way they engage with the, the, the global economy and to build resilience to external um, economic shocks. Um, you know, clearly the global recession is the biggest external shock we've seen in a long, long time. But it is you know, quite conceivable that we'll see uh, you know, other shocks occur um, over time. So it's about, it's about building resilience. It's also about, um, or that also involves um, very prudent uh, fiscal management. Um, when the good times uh, are around, when revenues are very high, that requires governments to be able to develop some, uh, some fiscal space, to be able to give them the, the opportunity to be able to stimulate uh, the domestic economy uh, when um, you know, the global tide turns against growth. Um, it's also about being very strategic in the selection of export markets. Uh, not to be overly dependent on some key markets in particular. And it's also too about you know, continuing to invest in, uh, in human capital, uh, in, in health and education, to ensure that we have resilient populations, that we identify and protect uh, particularly vulnerable groups. Um, and again too, just a very standard prescription is to ensure that we have sensible, stable macroeconomic management. And I think that's what uh, Team Oliste, or those factors are what Team Oliste need to look at in being able to, to manage the current global recession, noting that you know, over coming years we will see more uh, volatility, not quite at the scale we've seen recently, but we do need to manage volatility, and to do that we need to build resilience. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'll have another question from Dilly and then invite questions from Sydney. Uh, Mike, this is one for you from uh, Tim McLover, who is New Zealand ambassador to Timor-Leste. Do you see a useful and significant development role for military deployments like ISF International Stabilisation Force and RAMS-1 once stability has been achieved? Uh, Tim, I, uh, personally, I think it is uh, dangerous for military forces to take on long-term development tasks. It, A, I think obfuscates them from their proper mission and it gets into um, the military undertaking tasks that could more properly be undertaken by civil organisations. Having said that, I think it very much needs to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'm aware at the moment that one of the issues that is... Um, uh, being examined by the Timor-Leste Defence Force, uh, Fallontil FDTL, is what role they will play in nation building. There are many nations whose military contributes to nation building and also contributes in terms of disaster response to natural disasters. And I think that militaries can have a legitimate role to play, but they should be a focused role and they should not be at the expense of developing a vibrant and strong civil sector and militaries must always remember why they exist and what they're for. Thank you Mike. Uh, questions from Sydney now please. Uh, if you've got a question could you raise your hand please? Yep. Helen Hill, Victoria University in Melbourne. I think what Mike Smith said is very important about the need for the shared perspectives among the donors and the people in the country. And I, reflecting back on the events of 2006 in Timor-Leste, I recall that many of the donors came in and said, oh, this is a problem of unemployment and proceeded to put a lot of money into uh, programs for unemployed youth. Uh, whereas it struck me, being there at the time, it was much more of a problem of identity crisis among youth who'd had an inadequate secondary education and who regarded themselves as educated people but came out, sadly, without the skills to 
turn their farms into productive businesses and most of them were not actually unemployed but were walking away from jobs in their family farms. And I just wonder uh, about the situation of vulner vulnerability in countries like Timor-Leste and the Solomons comes about because you've got one group of people living in a sort of modern economy and another lot of people, the vast majority, living in the subsistence sector. And it seems to me until there's some Thing, some attention paid to what to do with the subsistence sector, whether to uh, uh, increase its productivity and use it, its surplus to coming to the cash sector or whether to get rid of it. I don't think I've ever heard a proper discussion among development people about the relationship between the subsistence sector and the cash sector in any of these countries. The Solomons is, is pretty much the same and P&G probably as well, I think. So I'm just wondering if any of the panellists would be able to make any comments on that. Uh, Kantan, could you uh, deal with that one, please? Well, uh, since you bring up this issue of um, employment, and employment is not um, actually the uh, problem, um, yes, in, in, in some sense, I, I do agree with you. Um, but on the, on the other hand, what, does, uh, what, does, uh, uh, what keeps some of these unemployed or the youth to stay back in rural areas. I mean, they come always to, to the urban areas in search of jobs. And if there are no jobs, then it becomes an issue. So on one hand, some of the projects which we have done is, uh, for example, going back to the example of uh, West Bank and Gaza, that most of our projects were in rural areas, were in areas where you can create local employment so that this kind of issue of them coming into urban areas looking for jobs could be, could be an issue. Um, and and uh, the same thing with regards to uh, um, Timor-Leste. We are uh, trying to create a kind of a work, workfare type of a program which looks at the needs in rural areas, in lo looks at uh, small municipalities, create employment in local areas. Lovely. Thank you, Kantan. Uh, Mike, another question uh, to you from Timor. Uh, this is from uh, Kieran uh, Dwexer from UNMIT. Uh, can you comment on what you see as the place for human rights, democratic and political participation in the process of this security development nexus? Uh, it's, a, it's a really tricky question, Kieran, and I don't have the answer, but I've got a few ideas. Um, I think uh, there's, I always argue, there's two sets of human rights issues that need to be addressed in this post-conflict environment. And they often get confused and are often seen as almost competing. Um, the first set is to try and help the new state develop human rights standards, protocols, procedures and and this is actually part of the rule of law issue I was talking about, that enables the country to move forward. This means that there will be standards that they will abide by, um, that it, it's addressing the future and moving forward. Then there is this really difficult issue of how do you address the past and affect reconciliation, which can take years, might take decades even. And this is, this is the question of justice and from the past rather than what justice will you use for the future. And sadly, I think in some of the missions when they get established and with some of the international uh, assistance, these two issues get confused. And often it's the same people trying to deal with both. And I think they have to be separated and seen as separate issues. Uh, they're not easy um, because people take a long time to um, affect justice and we're still seeing from, you know, World War II, some of these issues are still popping up. So it will take a long time. And we're seeing this now uh, in relation to um, what happened in uh, Portuguese Timor in 1975. Um, that's just raised its head. That's a long time after the event. So we can expect those things to go on and they will take a long time to, to resolve. So I, it's a very imperfect answer uh, to a very, very difficult question. 
and I'm sure other people have other views on that. Thank you, Mike. Uh, can we get another question from Sydney, please? Kirk Huffman, a research associate at the Australian Museum and honorary curator at the Vanuatu Culture Centre and on the board of the museum in Tahiti. Um, I'd just like to back up the thing that Dr. Hillard mentioned. You've made some really excellent points, all of you. One of the things one has to realize that in Melanesia, in the Western Pacific, almost 80% of the populations of Vanuatu, Solomons, Papua New Guinea are actually self-reliant. They're, they're really in the traditional economies and they're one of the areas in the world least affected by the world economic crisis. And I think the, it's those sort of populations that should be support, supported as much as possible in their continuation of their self-reliance. If you push them or force them into a money-type economy, you'll eventually create more instability. Relying on their land and their traditional agricultural systems gives them protection from the instability of the modern world. And as Alan Greenspan was quoted as saying last week, uh, there's another crisis, financial crisis in the pipeline. And as his lack of insight helped to create the last one, people ought to listen. Um, yes, so I'd just like to emphasize what Dr. Hill said. It's really important that one of the ways to protect those people is to actually, in a way, protect them from modern money. Don't force them into jobs <laughs> because uh, they're not unemployed if you've got 80% of the rural populations living off of their own land, as people should live in a normal world. They should be supported. They're self-reliant. And everybody in the world, all the NGOs and everybody is saying, we need to promote self-reliance. That's really what it's all about. Eh? Yes. Kirk. Uh, Mark, you'd like to comment on that? Yeah, look, um, uh, this is obviously, it is a big issue um, throughout the Pacific. Uh, my uh, first-hand experience is in the Solomon Islands and, and Papua New Guinea, uh, you know, where the vast majority of the populations of those countries are located in the subsistence sector, and they have been cushioned um, or protected from the adverse impacts of the global recession due to being located in the subsistence sector. Um, and that's something we need to recognise. Um, the other side of the coin, though, is that when we do have um, uh, better economic times, uh, when we do see uh, rapidly growing economies, those sectors don't uh, get to share in the, in the benefits of a, of a growing economy. So there's, there's a lot of discussion around being able to not to, not to push um, people from the subsistence sector into the modern economy, but to be able to the, uh, look at linkages between those, those sectors. Be, to be able to recognise that access to land in particular is a very important um, uh, a cushion, it's a very uh, important um, factor that means that people in those sectors are not so adversely affected by external uh, economic shocks. Um, in the Solomon Islands, we know that, um, look, you know, if you look at the modern economy, uh, if you look at the well, drivers in economic growth, there's only really two drivers there. One is logs, which is, a, is, is a, not a, sustain, a sustainable activity, and the other is the international community. Uh, now, 70% of the population uh, lives in the subsistence sector. Maybe we could look at other drivers of growth by linking the subsistence sector with the modern economy in a way that though protects the link between land and other institutions or factors that give people in those uh, sectors some protections from adverse uh, financial and other shocks. Thank you, Mark. We've got time for a, a couple more questions, one of which uh, is for Cantan and comes from Dinora Granadero uh, from NGO Forum in Timor-Leste. Um, this harks back to uh, one of the points that you made about unemployment in post-conflict countries. Um, and we're being asked, um, new job opportunities are being established, but it would seem that these opportunities are primarily going to international firms, particularly uh, in the case of the construction industry. What are your opinions on how this will impact on stability in Timor-Leste, and what can government agencies do to address this? Uh, thank you, Dinora. It's, it's, a, it's a very good question, and uh, uh, one of the lessons which we have learned in these type of um, employment creation and infrastructure community-based development type of projects is to keep uh, the projects localized. And in, in some sense, they are small projects. So these are not projects which huge companies would be able to bid for it, but rather community-based small projects. You have uh, uh, rehabilitation of a road, 
had, um, adding additional classrooms, building a clinic. These are very, very small projects. And that will also stimulate the local private sector because you're going to be using local materials. It's not very complex. So the, the chances of uh, uh, local contractors bidding and getting these jobs are much higher. Thank you, Kantan. We've got time for one more quick question from Sydney. Yes, at the back. Hello, I'm Francis. I'm from Macquarie University. I just want to know, you've used wonderful words, empowerment, collaborative, participatory, local. Lovely. I'm great words. How? How? I've recently reviewed a, a Ramsey um, report on the Solomon Islands done by the Pacific Islands Forum, which was all done in English. Um, a bunch of surveys, all conducted in English from Fiji. How? How is that participatory? How is that empowering? I'll leave that one to you. You're nodding furiously there. Yeah. <laughs> no, I think you're dead right. Uh, I think um, it's not going to happen overnight. Was it Francis, sorry? Yeah, Francis. It's not going to happen overnight. It, this is, I think we're at the very early stage of a long journey here, and we should recognise that. Uh, but the fact that everybody is, is recognising that need and now talking about it is a good sign. Uh, within Australia, my centre has been specifically tasked to assist uh, the other government departments and agencies in developing a conceptual framework for conflict and disaster management overseas. Uh, so we've been uh, contributing to these things overseas for a long time and we're now only coming to the point where we realise we're not doing it well enough in a coordinated fashion. That, that provides one example. Um, I mentioned the Geneva Conference roadmap, the three C's. That's another example. And I agree with you, we're very good at the words, but we're not so good at making it happen on the ground. And what I really hope is that we get a much better... Uh, understanding and a willingness to do what I call a top-down and a bottom-up approach at the same time because a couple of our questions have talked referred to you know Timor Leste in 2006 and one of the reasons and only one that that calamity occurred in 2006 was because governments and the international donor community was putting all the money at the top level and it wasn't going to the grassroots level. So governance was really government and government was not putting that money out to local communities and developing from the grassroots up. So you've got to do both. And making that all happen is not easy. It's hard work. Uh, and it's going to take a long time. So look, I share your concerns and I wrestle with it all the time. But then when I get, um, uh, you know, uh, too despondent, I always go back and read the Human Security Report and I think, well, at least we are moving forward. Thank you, Mike. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's all we have time for today. So I'd just like to thank our panellists, Kantan Shankar, uh, Mark McGillivray and Michael Smith. Uh, you can see this edition of Praxis at www.worldbank.org forward slash PI. Praxis will return again next month. Until then, thank you very much.